one, which is Freedom Mortgage Corporation versus Engel. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. I'm Brian Sutherland for Appellant Freedom Mortgage. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal, please. You may, sir. Thank you. The filing of a stipulation to discontinue revokes the lender's prior election to accelerate because the filing is an overt act that is evidence of and discloses the lender's choice to stop seeking immediate payment in full. Under the common law, if the contract does not specify a just what the parking must do. I have a question. Yes, Judge Rivera. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the the stipulation and the voluntary and the discontinuance may be for a variety of reasons. If it's actually silent as to acceleration or deceleration, how is the court to ever assess whether or not it really is the basis for the stip? Well, uh, two answers to that, Your Honor. Uh, first, any time that the lender discontinues, whether or not it has uh, multiple potential reasons for doing so, it is going to want to decelerate or elect to revoke the acceleration in any one of those scenarios. So one might be that the lender expects uh, that the borrower will resume making payments. Or another reason, the one that the second department perhaps has in mind, will be that the uh, lender wants to fix a procedural issue with the case. But in either one of those situations, it has to revoke the uh, election to accelerate in order to do that. And so the discontinuance is evidence of election, regardless of the underlying motivation. And the court should keep those two questions separate. First, uh, did we make a choice? Have we uh, elected to revoke? And then separately, if there is a question about abusing the judicial process in some way, that should be addressed after the court uh, resolves the question of whether we have revoked and ask whether the borrower has demonstrated that the revocation would cause substantial prejudice. Now, turning to the second part of your honor's uh, question, the stipulation here is not signed. Uh, it points directly to the foreclosure complaint and it says we are withdrawing the only vehicle by which a claim for acceleration was made. So it is saying to the world that the allegations in that complaint are not ones that we are seeking to enforce or prove any longer. And what the second department did here was look at the stipulation in a vacuum, didn't read it together uh, with the foreclosure complaint. And it said, well, where is um, the terms of the loan? But parties wouldn't ordinarily put the terms of the loan or statements about whether they'll be accepting monthly installments or not in a document that is going to become a court order. If they do that, the terms of the loan are then part of a court order and subject to judicial supervision. Uh, and then there could be a contempt motion because Mr. Engel didn't pay his monthly installments, or maybe he's bringing a contempt motion against us because we're not accepting his monthly installments. So the parties aren't going to want to put the terms of their loan in a stipulation to discontinue. Uh, also, at 2013, the time of the stipulation to but, discontinue. Judge, I have a question. Yes, Judge Fahey. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Sutherland, uh, one of the distinctions that is drawn uh, by the second department opinion uh, and in some of the briefs is the distinction between uh, the note and the foreclosure action. And uh, the way I understand that argument is, is that the basis of the right um, to accelerate the debt is in the note in the contract and the basis in the foreclosure action um, uh, simply um, is a separate proceeding and can't, you cannot use a, uh, a judicial remedy like a foreclosure action for failure to do something as uh, the basis of, uh, of a contract action. And that appears to be what's being done here. Um, that problem may be solvable um, but it seems that what they've suggested is it's solvable by simply providing notice to any party. And the notice would be uh, that you've got to expressly say um, what you're doing when you do it. Well, yes. Uh, if the problem is solvable simply by giving notice, that presupposes that we have the power to revoke. Yeah, but, something... you know, that, that's not my point, though. Yes, my point right. is, is that uh, your position um, requires 
uh, an implicit understanding of uh, um, the accelerated debt and the voluntary disclosure is, is excuse me, the voluntary discontinuance. Uh, and uh, that should be, and their point is, as I understand it, is it must be expressed. And if you think about it in a larger context, um, in, in, in the, this court's jurisprudence on contract law, pretty consistently um, talks about uh, um, the express nature of contracts and that um, whenever anyone's rights are in play, that uh, you have to expressly lay it out. And once you do that, once you've expressly done that, then you may go ahead and voluntarily discontinue. That's the way I understand it. And so wouldn't it be more in line with our jurisprudence to require, to require not that you cannot voluntarily discontinue and, it's, and to accelerate or not accelerate the debt, but that whatever you're doing, that it be expressly laid out there and not implicitly laid out there? Well, Judge Fahey, let me see if I can answer your question. I think that this court's jurisprudence uh, doesn't say what a party must do to exercise a right under a contract. And I'm referring to the court's decision in Albertina Realty, which says we need not just decide just what a party must do. To <clears throat> Let me stop you there. Doesn't Albertina Realty refer to an unequivocal overt act? And the way I understand your argument is, is that uh, the voluntary discontinuance is a overt act. Am I right it about is that? It's an overt act. Yeah. All right. Yes, so, so let me take it further then. If that's the case, then um, uh, how is the other party, and honestly, quite often many of these people are pro se litigants, how are they to know what's happening without it being expressly stated in the uh, discontinuance itself? Doesn't seem to be any great burden on you. Well, the, the burden that the second department imposed didn't exist in 2013, but here's how the borrower is to know. Even a pro se borrower, Mr. Engels certainly is not one. He's a non-resident landlord real estate investor and he has private counsel. But even a pro se borrower knows that we have stopped an action for immediate payment in full. Given that we have stopped the action for immediate payment in full, it stands to reason that we are no longer seeking immediate payment in full. The lender needs the judicial action in order to obtain that immediate payment Without that judicial action, it cannot obtain the immediate payment. Or Chief, put I have a question when it's done. Please continue uh, your answer, counsel, and then we'll move to Judge Feynman. Yes, Your Honor. Just to conclude, uh, there's no rational reason for a lender to forego the judicial enforcement and continue to seek immediate payment in full. Certainly, there's no evidence in this record that Freedom Mortgage continue to seek immediate payment in full after the discontinuance. Uh, yes, Judge Feynman. So I actually have two different questions uh, and answer them uh, at your leisure. Um, part of your brief, I think, discussed the nullification theory based on Loeb, but I don't hear you arguing that today. Uh, so uh, is your principal argument uh, going to be the overt act of discontinuance uh, and, and that theory? The, the reason why Loeb is important is because the common law provides that a discontinuance nullifies the prior action and even pro se litigants are charged with knowledge of the common law. And that's what makes the discontinuance particularly clear evidence that the lender has made a choice. And what Mr. Engel has argued is that the parties need to enter into a contract to extend the limitations period and we reject that framework because we're dealing with different causes of action, one that accrued in 2008 and one that accrued in 2013, if indeed we uh, are able to revoke an election to accelerate. And so we think the question ought to be, is there evidence in this record from which a reasonable person could conclude that, uh, that Freedom Mortgage revoked its acceleration? And part of that is um, the common law says that when you discontinue a prior action, you are nullifying what was done therein. So it is, in fact, a clear message, especially to a counsel borrower that we are withdrawing and no longer seeking to prove the allegations of the complaint. And again, the complaint is- I have a question, only. please, Judge. I have a question. Please. So, uh, counsel, just to be clear, if, if I take your argument to its logical uh, conclusion, it means that there would never be any limit on how often you could accelerate and decelerate. You could do this every 
every other month that there's a default. Is that your position that there's, there's never an end to this? It seems to be somewhat beyond what any statute of repose would allow there, for. Two, two responses, Judge Rivera. There's absolutely a limit. Separate the questions whether we revoked from the question whether equity should intervene to stop the revocation. If a party is abusing the judicial process by revoking again and again and again, then yes, equity should absolutely intervene and stop that. But that is not what happened here. Mr. Engel is the one who abused the judicial process. He had actual knowledge of our foreclosure complaint. So, so how many times is do we say, now that would just be inequitable. Now that's abuse because would you not be doing this every time there's a default, which your position is, and it doesn't seem wrong to me on its face, that that is your right under the agreements with the debtor. It is our right. I'm only acknowledging that there could come a time when a lender is abusing the judicial process, certainly not our case, but the scenario that some of the amici, and I think Mr. Engel also posit, is that the courts will necessarily be subject to endless revocations followed by more accelerations simply will not occur because the courts can act in equity to block the revocation. But that scenario is entirely distinct from the question whether any evidence of revocation exists in the Chief, first instance. Chief Judge, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, I, I just, I, I wanna uh, understand this a little bit better. First of all, um, if, if a lender were to continually discontinue or revo uh, revoke its acceleration, the, the, at least the periodic payments, say the monthly payments for which the, um, for which the statute of limitations would have run, uh, they, are, they can no longer be sought the next time they accelerate. Am, is, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. And, and, and that and, I'm sorry, and, 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 but the other thing is, is that, um, I just want to clarify as well that when you talk about nullifying um, what's occurred in the action, you're not necessarily, you're not no, actually nullifying the acceleration itself, but you're saying we want to stop the acceleration that we, um, that we did in this complaint and no longer seek to enforce it. Am, am I correct in understanding you? Yes, that's our position, Your Honor. I, I think the discontinuance is particularly clear evidence of our choice. We're no longer seeking immediate payment full. And yes, it, it is a, an important point. The two actions are different because in the section action, the second action, we are no longer seeking monthly installments that are time barred. So the two actions seek different amounts. Uh, the acceleration in each one is a substantive conditioned precedent to the borrower's obligation to pay. And, and so if the borrower has changed its position in reliance on your acceleration, that would that give a court uh, the authority to, um, to disallow it or to not recognize it as valid? 100%, that's the Kilpatrick case and other cases that follow it. If the borrower showed substantial prejudice uh, in reliance on our acceleration, then we could not accelerate again. So I think there are at least two possibilities for blocking the revocation in order to prevent uh, the nightmare scenarios that the borrower uh, would posit, uh, prejudice to the borrower or abuse of the judicial process, either one absolutely not present in this case. Judge, if I can ask one last question. Yes, Your Honor. Please. Thank you. Okay, so counsel, what, what is the burden in just sending a letter to the debtor confirming you've, de you've decelerated? What, what is so difficult about doing that? That would make it clear to everybody what your intent was. Wouldn't have courts wasting their time on any of the equity issues in that way, other than as you suggest, if there's abuse. Why not just do that? It's one piece of paper. The, those requirements didn't exist in 2013. And if you think about it, a letter wouldn't have been enough in this case because the foreclosure action would continue. The discontinuance is the only thing that could stop the request for immediate payment in full. No, I'm because saying in, in addition to the discontinuance, since you, I, I understand your point that you don't want to include every term in whatever your stipulation is. I understand that it makes total sense, but then why not, why not put it in writing and archive it that way moving forward? Well, you know, I, I think that the second department had the same question and said, well, why not include a whole bunch of different statements? 
Um, we could not have anticipated that requirement in 2013 when we discontinued. Yes, it's something that lenders can do going forward. It's something that I assume they are doing and will do going forward. The requirement didn't exist then and there was no reason to believe that it did exist. I think that the answer that I gave is, is probably the most, uh, the, the most explanatory one, that parties don't wanna put the terms of their agreement, including whether they're going to accept monthly installments or not, in a document that will become a court order. Uh, and that explains why they didn't do it in 2013, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Counsel? Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. A, a stipulation of discontinuance is, is simply a contract to terminate a lawsuit. That's it. When a stipulation of discontinuance in a foreclosure action is silent on the statute of limitations and doesn't contain the borrower's express acknowledgement of the debt and promise to pay, it cannot have any effect on the statute of limitations. And a court can't imply a revocation of an acceleration into a stipulation which says no such thing. You know, the Chief, may, I notion. Chief may I ask a question? Judge Garcia, yes. Um, counsel, would you agree, you know, along the lines of the questioning that's just been going on with your adversary, that if a letter or a notice had been sent at the time of the stipulation, that would have been sufficient? No, for the, for the reason, again, that there is no unilateral right of a party to affect the statute of limitations. So while the lender may deaccelerate, the operation of that deacceleration cannot affect the statute of limitations. Assume that argument is, is rejected. For the purposes of this question, what would your answer be? It would require an unequivocal overt act. And the mere, so yes, so if the letter contains express language saying, we hereby deaccelerate the loan, you may resume making monthly installment payments of X, which we will accept, then yes. So how would that address the problem of repeated acceleration and deacceleration if the only extra step is to send a letter? Well, that's why I guess our, our, our primary contention is that unilateral deacceleration cannot affect the statute of limitations because again, a, a litigant has no vested right to unilaterally manipulate the statute of limitations. There is a means that the legislature- well, Really, your whole it. argument is premised on that first point that Correct. they have no right to accelerate, they have no right to deaccelerate, and after that it's, you know, that's your primary argument. Well, they certainly have a right to, they certainly have a right to accelerate under the loan documents. It's that they have no right to unilaterally deaccelerate as a means of, of extending or manipulating the statute of limitations. Understood. Well, Chief, I have a question. Hey, um, Judge Feynman? How do you know whether they're doing it to, I mean, doesn't that drag us into some sort of morass of getting into their intent? Are they intending to uh, manipulate the statute of limitations? That, that, that's part of the concern that I have about not having some bright line rule. So certainly under the, under the rule announced by the appellate division, again here, let's not lose sight of the fact that a stipulation of discontinuance is a contract governed by contract interpretation principles. So if there was an intention to revoke the acceleration, the time and place to do so would have been to expressly insert it into that discontinuance. So really the rule advanced by Freedom Mortgage would return summary judgment jurisprudence on its ear by saying it, silence leads to a question of fact, but that's just not consistent with our summary judgment jurisprudence. Silence in a contract doesn't create ambiguity and omission doesn't create an ambiguity. Counsel, is there any evidence in the record that Freedom did not intend the discontinuance to deaccelerate the debt? Yes. In fact, there's, there's an admission at, at Appendix 156. This is uh, Freedom Mortgage's memorandum of law in support of their summary judgment motion, where they, they disclosed that the reason why the 08 action was discontinued was, quote, the 08 action was eventually set down for a traverse hearing and discontinued four years after the commencement of the action when the process server was unavailable to testify. So again, they were confronted with the potential dismissal of the 08 action on personal jurisdiction grounds. A dismissal on jurisdiction grounds does not afford a lender the six month savings of the statute of limitations under 205A. So they saw perhaps saw the writing on the wall and said, let me not double down and roll the dice on the Traverse hearing. So, I mean, and that, that, that admission is, is again repeated in the record at, at Appendix 163, where 
Prior to the Travers hearing, the plaintiff stipulated to discontinue the 08 action due to the defective service on the defendant. So again, the notion that a discontinuance is always, as a matter of law, embodied uh, the embodiment of intention to allow the borrower to resume making monthly installment payments simply is, is flatly contradicted by this record. And then even taking it out of the larger context, both Mr. Engel and the Legal Aid Society and Mishi have cited a bit collectively about a half a dozen cases where lenders have discontinued because they find some procedural defect with their action, be it a failure to serve the 90-day notice under 1304, the failure to acquire personal jurisdiction, robo-signature documents, the failure to, to verify the veracity of signatures. So again, under the rule announced by the Appellate Division, what's so unworkable about expressly indicating to the debtor we are revoking the acceleration because we intend for you to resume making monthly installment payments. Chief, I have a couple of questions if you allow me. Yes, of course. Um, counsel, the answer you just gave suggested to me that the uh, lender's reason here was in fact to revoke the acceleration so as to extend the statute of limitations. So I'm not sure that the evidence in the record you're pointing to uh, supports the, the point you're trying to make, but if you wanna address that, you can. The question I have for you is this. It, putting aside your argument about unilateral ability, so just put that to the side for a minute. Assume that, that the lender here has unilateral ability. What is the difference between a rule, prospectively, a rule that says a voluntary discontinuance of an action automatically revokes an acceleration, and a rule that says you must say in writing to the borrower, we are revoking the acceleration? What is the practical difference between those two? Because in the absence of, of an express indication to the borrower that the loan has been deaccelerated, the borrower is none the wiser as to whether it may resume making monthly installment payments and the lender will accept them. Because acceleration and deacceleration affects such a sea change in the, in the debtor-creditor relationship under the loan documents. You know, once a loan is accelerated, the creditor has no obligation to accept monthly installment payments. So if the borrower is essentially left in the dark, in purgatory as to whether they can resume making monthly installment payments. For all we know, look, a borrower be able to pay the full accelerated amount, but may be able to resume afford making the $2,000 monthly installment payment. So again, it, we beg the question, what's so unworkable in, in that circumstance of a rule which simply requires the creditor, if they intend to deaccelerate, to expressly state that to the borrower. Chief Judge, if, may I follow up on That's that? Fine. Um, just following up on Judge Wilson's question, but so what's the difference? Because if the rule is, is that uh, a, a stipulation of discontinuance or notice of discontinuance um, uh, revokes the acceleration, then, um, then, then the, the borrower will know that they can make their um, their monthly installment payments until such time as the lender um, uh, re-accelerates, and and that's the rule. So how I don't understand how that that leaves the borrower in in some kind of uh, situation where they they don't know what the rule is. They they make their payment, and unless the bank uh, uh, gives another notice of acceleration it's accepted. And if it's not, then, then, then they can raise that in court the next time that they're brought into court. Well, here again, we have a, we have a discontinuance, a stipulation. So which require, it requires two to tango, so to speak here. So you had Mr. Engel, who had every right to insist upon going forward with the Traverse hearing, rolling the dice, if you will. And if he was successful with that Traverse hearing and the statute of limitations had expired in the interim, the claim would undoubtedly have been time bar because there is no six month savings for a well, well, jurisdictional unless, dismissal. Unless the bank made a motion to discontinue and the court granted that motion. Doesn't that put the, the, the borrower again back in the same position? Well, again, there a motion for discontinuance if it's purely intended to avoid an adverse result, I think the outcome would have been the same here. A, court can, a, a litigant can't use a discontinuance as a means of evading a possible adverse result. They made their bed, they have to lie in it. So they are again, imposing or by implication, a waiver of the statute of limitations or, or, or a revocation of the acceleration and a stipulation which says no such thing 
is in the context of Mr. Engel's loan inherently unfair because he forfeited a potential defense. I guess in the larger context of borrowers in general, the statute of limitations is not only a defense, but it's the foundation of an affirmative right to relief to discharge a mortgage under RPAPL 15014. So I guess for those two reasons, the need to expressly indicate that is essential because for all we know, Mr. Engel would have never stipulated to it. And the fact that I guess we have a virtual room of lawyers here pondering whether he would or wouldn't really shows how unworkable the rule advanced by the bank is when it would have been very simple had the parties intended to do so to embody that in their contract. Chief, may I try again? Yes, Judge Wilson. Counsel, I think that your answer, to, it goes back to what Judge, Judge Garcia was asking at the beginning, which is your whole argument depends on the proposition that both Mr. Engel and the bank have to agree. Otherwise, I'm not, I still am not understanding what the difference is between Mr. between the bank sending a letter saying we are unilaterally revoking the acceleration and a, uh, a, a rule that says a stipulation does that. Well, again, if, if, if revocation, because revocation has the effect of delaying, postponing or accruing the statute of limitations, that also implicates New York public policy, right? Can so that be instance, done unilaterally? Course, That's the, the question is, can that be done unilaterally? And it seems and, to me you you think not, but if the answer to that is it can be done unilaterally, I'm not sure where your argument goes. Well, again, because, and I guess, so that simply begs, I guess, we, we can't avoid the 500 pound elephant in the room, so to speak, as to whether it can be done unilaterally. And it would appear under Flagstar, at least unilaterally as a means to have any effect on the statute of limitations, the answer would be no, because Again, while Flagstar indicated that freedom of contract is alive and well in New York, when the form or effect of that contract would be to postpone or delay the accrual of a claim under the statute of limitations, then the freedom of contract must yield to the public policy embodied by the statute of limitations. Chief and Judge, that's, that's the very question? effect of deacceleration. Yes, is, Judge Stein. Yeah, my question is, is, did you raise that in the Supreme Court in this action? Well, in the essence, look, this is a, that's a purely legal argument under the preservation jurisprudence. So I think the ca court can and should reach it because, again, it's a purely legal argument, which couldn't have been avoided by factual counter steps or any discovery. It's really a question of interpreting an unambiguous document, the stipulation of discontinuance or the loan documents themselves, holding them up against the public policy of New York and against statutes such as CPLR 201, which say that no court may extend the statute of limitations. Uh, statutes such as CPLR 203, which is in essence say that statute of limitations jurisprudence for a court is a matter of simple arithmetic. Find out when the claim accrued, if find I'm out when the claim the was interposed. Judge, if I may yes. ask a question, please, thank you. Okay, so, so counsel, if I'm understanding uh, what you're trying to argue here, putting aside the preservation question for one moment, it seems your position is that you get one shot at that acceleration unless the parties then agree that you get more than one shot at that acceleration. Is that the way you view this? As a, as a means of affecting the statute of limitations, yes, because- Well, then let me ask this. Uh, no, I understand the rest of the argument. So then let me ask this, and it may violate all, all rules of contract and what we understand of mortgages, but I'm just gonna put it out there. So why, why isn't it that, it that what happens is that the financial institution loses the opportunity to raise a claim of, to assert acceleration, right? They lose that right, but not the right to keep demanding payments. So they can't call the whole debt in, but the, the debtor is still on the hook for those installments. Why can't it be viewed that way? Well, again, I mean, I because I guess because the, the operation of deacceleration, unilateral deacceleration would be to extend or postpone the accrual of a claim. We have stat statutory provisions which are entirely on point. General Obligations Law 17-105. There the legislature has essentially prescribed a scheme for how, how borrowers and lenders, if they truly intend to agree to deaccelerate, can do so. So the fact that the legislature went to the, the trouble, if you will, of enacting this whole scheme for a court to recognize a practice. No, but all, I, all I'm saying is what, uh, uh, again, what doctrines, what rules would prevent one from seeing what is extinguished is the right to seek acceleration in the future, not 
the the debt, not the the promise to keep paying uh, the money that was borrowed plus whatever interest it is. But all well, that's look, the, I guess under, under our... is the request that I want it all paid now. I'm not, I'm not going to do this on installments. I'm not going to give you more time. I want it up front. Again, look, I guess under our statute of limitations jurisprudence, right, the expiration of the statute of limitations just merely bars the remedy, not necessarily the right. So the remedy of foreclosure would be barred, I guess, the contract right, if Mr. Engel or any borrower was so inc inclined and so magnanimous, they, they could continue to make payments. It's just that the right of foreclosure would be extinguished. It's the right to invoke the aid of the court to enforce that accelerated obligation would be extinguished by the I, I'm not making myself clear, and it may be because it's such an inappropriate way of thinking about it, given, given our doctrines. All I'm saying is, wouldn't that allow, though, the lending institution to continue with every default to, to seek the payment as opposed to foreclosure? Just seek the payment. Well, not necessarily because, look, under these loan documents, they're really a hybrid instrument, right? They start as an installment obligation where the borrower agrees to pay monthly installments over the course of 30 years. Then when the lender accelerates, it really becomes a demand instrument. There's no, when I accelerate, there's no such th further thing as monthly installments. It's now one unitary obligation, which is due immediately. So Thank there's really you, no Kevin. way of putting the two oh, back have, in the tube, have, so to speak. One last yeah, question, Judge. Judge. I, I know we're a little over. Thank you. Um, just so I, I'm clear on this, um, uh, the uh, uh, voluntary discontinuance, is that a product of a stipulated settlement or is it a one party voluntary discontinuance of the action? You understand what I'm saying? Correct, yeah, I get a stipulation, I guess, under CPLR principles by definition imparts All a right. two party agreement. So, yes. so what you're saying is, is that this isn't a pure one party uh, uh, discontinuance. This is instead an agreement between the parties. Correct. And I think, I think we've maintained All right. So it. let me take a step back. So that being the case, the way I understood Judge Wilson's question then was, if you're agreeing, why couldn't you include notice in the agreement? Notice of the accelerated, uh, uh, of the, uh, um, of the reversion to uh, a monthly mortgage payment. Well, then there, I, look, I, there, I would agree that to the extent this stipulation reflected had expressed language of revocation, that would be entirely permissible because the parties in that instance are allowed to expressly agree, even under the general obligations right. law, to extend, reset, so what, postpone the statute. So am I right in saying that what you're asking for could have been done here in the stipulated agreement? Is that correct? Cor correct. Even under the general obligations law, yes, it could have been. I, I see. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Mr. Sutherland? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, you know, Mr. Engel's entire theory here is not only one that is unpreserved, but one that contradicts his admissions below. And he said on page 213 of the record that Freedom Mortgage could have revoked its acceleration and quote, uh, in a simple letter stating that it was revoking the acceleration. That's paragraph 18 on page 213. So the entire theory that he's offering now is simply one that is unpreserved. The purpose of the stipulation was not to enter into a contract. Uh, if I may ask rule. a question, please? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Council, I'm gonna ask you, I think you've heard it, the question I asked uh, Mr. Engel's uh, attorney, why can't we view it as what's extinguished is the right to seek acceleration of the debt, but not the demand for the payment? Why can't we view it that way? You can't view it that way because the contract gives us the right to seek acceleration in connection with any one of the distinct defaults. And there's a default anytime a borrower misses a monthly payment. We have a right to seek acceleration in connection with any one of those defaults. And our second foreclosure action is based on a series of distinct defaults that occurred after 2008, all the way through the time of the 2015 complaint. And as well, we already- I guess I'm not being- clear, and again, it may be because it's a radical way of thinking about it that is not supported by doctrine. Um, my, my question is, why can't we see, let, let's say we disagreed with you, and we, we took the view of the appellate division, and we say the action would otherwise be time barred on the acceleration, on the foreclosure. Why can't we view it as that's correct, but you're still able to seek the payment of the debt, you just can't make a demand for it to be paid up front for all of it to be paid upon a default. 
All you get to do is keep asking for the payment. Right. Uh, it, that, that is a hard question for me to answer because it's not one that's been offered by any court or any part or even any amicus brief. So it would be something new in this case. Um, I understand. I, I think is that there a contractual provision that prohibits that? Is there some understanding between the parties that prohibits that? Is there some contractual doctrine that would not allow us to look at the note and the mortgage in that way? Yes, because both the note and the mortgage say that even if we don't enforce a right, we can do so again in the future if we want to do that. Uh, yes, that's but, here you, but here you're arguing you did and then you revoked it. We did. So say you did. And so the day is done. That, that is now extinguished. You don't get to do that again. Right, so our first cause of action is gone and we can't accelerate again in connection with the March 2008 default, say. That would be barred by uh, race judicata or collateral estoppel, one of those two. Can't accelerate again in connection with the March 2008 default, but we can accelerate in connection with the 2013 defaults, the 2014 defaults and the 2015 defaults. We can accelerate again under this contract. And I would like to return to Judge Wilson's question about whether there's a practical difference. And the question raises an excellent point. There is no practical difference between a rule that says a discontinuance automatically revokes an election to accelerate and a rule requiring statements in a letter. Either one of those rules going forward uh, means that the bar has notice of what they have to do, but the rule requiring an automatic deceleration based on the discontinuance is even clearer because there's then, then, then there's not a fight about what the particular language in the letter said. So but I'm sorry, uh, Chief, if I may on this, if I may on this, but but counsel, I think if I can circle back to, I believe it's Judge Fahey's initial questioning, that again would mean implying something as opposed to adhering to our doctrines of contracts, which which, which require express statements. Well, that, to, to be that's also the clear. Difference. We, we don't need Judge Wilson's rule to win. Under principles of contract, we win because the evidence discloses that the lender made an election. Um, that's the point. But, but, but wait, Judge Feynman? It's just to finish up. So I wanna be clear, um, under Judge Wilson's rule, you know, it doesn't really matter, A, whether it's a, a, a stipulation or just a voluntary discontinuance. The discontinuance puts you on notice as the borrower that you now have the uh, option to uh, resume monthly payments. Is yes, that you're advocating. That, our position is that a motion to discontinue is an overt act by the lender. A stipulation to discontinue is an overt act by the lender. A letter from the lender to the borrower is an overt act. What you're looking for, uh, in, my, in my view, is evidence of an election not a contract to extend the 2008 limitations period. We're dealing with an entirely separate limitations period, one that began in 2013. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor.